thank you for the introduction. And uh, yeah, that's actually, I think, uh, very appropriate. I do quite a bit of traveling. Uh, and today I'd like to tell you a bit of a story, uh, a tale of two rubies. So uh, real quickly, just uh, quick about me. I uh, live in Ankara, Turkey, which is uh, actually a very nice place, and uh, work for Burnside Digital. Okay. So, formalities out of the way. Show of hands, how many of you use or have used for n not just playing around, but actually like used to build products, uh, two rubies? Three? Four? <laughs> five? How many of you have only used one ruby? Okay, most of you. I, I think that's fairly typical. Uh, in fact, there are actually a lot of Ruby implementations. Now, not all of these are at the same level of, of usability, uh, but there is quite a variety in the Ruby community, which is really interesting. But now, if you've gotten this far and you've only ever used one implementation, you might be asking yourself, so what? What, what impact do all of these Rubies have on me as a Rubyist if MRI gives me everything that I need? There's a more slightly insidious question that might be in the back of your mind. What about fragmentation? Some of you may be aware that there are languages and language communities that have undergone this process where multiple implementations have forked off and become incompatible, and what that consequently does is it takes the community and it forks the community. And soon, where you once had one community that was vibrant, you end up with five or six communities, and none of them can sustain the uh, critical mass that it takes to uh, keep something that's uh, a, a, you know, community-driven uh, to keep it going. Uh, very famously, small talk is uh, thought to have suffered from this, and it's one of the reasons why it's not more popular today. Well, I'm going to tell you a story, and hopefully by the time I'm done with this story, I'll convince you not only that other implementations of Ruby are important to you, even if you don't use them, but also to convince you that having all of these implementations of Ruby is actually a really good thing, and it's not as dangerous as we might think. So the story begins with a Rails app, as so many do, and in this case, it was an app that we were porting from MRI to JRuby. Now, there's a fairly standard script that you're going to follow if you ever have to do this. You have to get rid of C extensions. In our case, we were only using one, and it was pretty easy to replace it. You are going to want to look for JRuby-specific versions of your gems. Uh, things like NoCoGiri have pure, J J uh, pure, sorry, pure Java implementations. But there's other gems where they might work with JRuby, but there might be an alternate gem that actually works even better with JRuby, because JRuby, of course, benefits from the entire Java ecosystem. You're going to have to find a good app server if you're doing this with Rails, because the typical ones, Unicorn and Thin, are not going to work. In our case, we use TorqueBox, but there's also Passenger that you can use and a handful of others. And finally, and this is really the critical part, you need to have a test suite. You need to have a good test suite, and you need to run it very frequently. Because this is going to help you chase down all of the deep, dark corners where there might be subtle differences between what JRuby is capable of and what MRI can do. So this is exactly what we did, and in running our test suite, we had a handful of failing tests. But there was one in particular that was, uh, let's say, a little troubling, because it was generating this error, argument error, comparison of active support time with zone with active support time with zone failed. Okay, now you may have run into these comparison of A with B failed error messages before, but I'm going to suspect that you've probably never had the case where A and B are the same class. It kind of doesn't make sense. Why can you not compare one object of a class to another object of the same class? Well, we're going to get into why this happened, but uh, before we do, I wanted to take a moment to talk about reading code. And my recommendation for you with reading code is very simple. You need to read code. No, really. You need to be reading a lot of code. 
uh, let's say you need to write at least, or read at least twice as much code as you write. Maybe 10 times as much as you write. Whatever the number is, I'm not really sure what the right number is, you really, if you're going to be a good developer, need to make a conscious effort to read code. Don't avoid reading code. You should actually take pleasure in reading code. And really just reading it is all you need to do. I, I'm sure you can find any number of tutorials and, and suggestions on, well, you should do this, and you should read this file first, and then that. To be perfectly honest, it doesn't matter. When you read enough code, you will eventually develop your own system. But the reason that it's so important is because when we run up against bugs, like the one that I just showed before, you're going to be forced to read code. And at that point, if you've gotten practice reading code, it's going to be slightly less painful to have to dig in and find out where that bug originates. OK, so I hope you are all uh, wide awake and, and prepared, because this is going to start going a little bit fast. OK, so we had a comparison, active support time with zone, and it failed. Let's dive into the code. So we immediately jump into the actual definition of active support time with zone. We find that there is a class time with zone that's defined there. It includes comparable. Now, uh, I hope most of you are uh, familiar with some of the modules that are available in the Ruby standard library. Comparable is one of them. And essentially, all comparable does is it makes it so that if you define this, uh, what's often called the spaceship operator, then for free, you get less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. right? And the spaceship operator, really all it does is it does a comparison A to B, and it returns negative 1, uh, 0, or 1, depending on whether uh, they're ordered in less than, equal, or greater than. And in this case, Active Support's time with zone class defines a spaceship operator, which simply passes through to UTC and uses that, uh, that object, spaceship operator, on other. What's UTC? Glad you asked. Turns out it's a method that returns a memoized instance variable. In this case, if UTC is set, it'll be returned. If not, it's going to call period to UTC. What's period? Well, period is a method that returns a memoized instance variable that, if it exists, it'll get returned. If not, it's going to call time zone period for UTC on UTC, which might not be defined because that's what we're trying to. There's an initializer. The initializer can take a UTC time, a time zone, possibly a local time, possibly a period. It might set UTC and time zone or period based on UTC. Uh, yeah. OK. At this point, you've got to take a step back and ask yourself, when was the last time you called time with zone new anyway? This is not how you get active support time with zone objects. The way you normally do that is by calling a method on time or date time called in time zone. These are methods also defined in active support. So we go and we find their implementation. Uh, it's in active support's core extensions directory, right? So active support adds a lot to Ruby's core classes. And in this case, it's in either time zones or date time zones. And both of the methods look very, very similar. It's going to call active support time with zone new. And this UTC question mark method is, uh, again, a method defined in the core library that just simply returns uh, whether or not the offset from UTC is 0, right? So if it was already a UTC def defined time or not. Uh, if it was, then we're going to call the constructor with self. If not, we're going to call get UTC, which is just a method that converts a time or a date time with a UTC offset into the UTC equivalent with the 0 offset. OK, so now we have that constructor, which is setting this UTC instance variable. And we're finding out that depending on which of these two methods we call, that UTC object is going to either be a time or a date time. Of course, we probably could have gotten here a little bit quicker than hunting through the code if we had simply read the comment that exists a short way above the definition of the time with zone class that says you should never need to create a time with zone instance directly call one of those two methods that we just looked at. So um, read code and the comments. <laughs> OK, so where are we so far? Time with zone initializes UTC to a time or a date time. 
comparison uh, with the spaceship operator from time with zone is going to just pass through to the spaceship operator on one of those two objects. But this is how I was able to reduce our failing test case and demonstrate the problem. After loading up active support time and time with zone and getting a time zone, that's all those first three lines are doing, uh, I created an active support time with zone object, first by calling in time zone on a time object, and then by calling time in time zone with a date time object. And it turns out if we take the one that's initialized from date time and compare it to time, we get false. Good. That's exactly how this is supposed to behave. But if we flip it and we do time less than date time, that's when we get our exception. Now here's the thing. This works in MRI, but not in JRuby. Why? Well, remember when we were looking at the definition of time with zone? I passed over this little bit at the top here where it says self name. We're going to pretend we're a time, right? To thwart type checking, because who doesn't like thwarting type checking, right? Gets worse. Turns out that active support time with zone also defines is a. So that if you ask an active support time with zone object if it is a time, it's going to lie to you and say that it is. Wonderful. Remember the spaceship operator that's being called on UTC, right? Which is either a time or a date time. Well, it turns out active support, conveniently enough, redefines the spaceship operator for time and date time. Here it is for date time. And this one's pretty vanilla. It's simply taking this case of if you're comparing with infinity, then we're going to return infinity. Fine, I don't care. Uh, otherwise, we're going to take the thing we're comparing to, we're going to convert it to a date time, so now we're comparing date times to date times. OK, that seems fine. And by the way, active support defines two date time on a, probably a dozen objects. So you know, this is a method that is going to work most of the time. Oh, but in time. The spaceship operator is redefined using this uh, alias method chain style, where uh, we're using this compare with coercion. Right? So we're checking to see if the thing we're comparing to is a time. If it is, then we're going to uh, do the regular comparison, the regular spaceship operator that we alias below. Right? If not, then we're going to convert ourselves to a date time and do a comparison to the other. Right, so that, that goes back to that definition that we saw one slide ago, where date times are converting other things to date times to do the comparisons. But you remember, time with zone redefined is a. So if other happens to be a time with zone, we're going to go through the first branch, not the second. The first branch is going to be calling the spaceship operator that's defined on time by the standard library. OK. This isn't a Rails talk, seriously. OK. This is just where we had to go to get to the heart of the matter. And that's how JRuby implements the spaceship operator on the time class. OK, it's Java now. So uh, we're going to jump around a little bit. There's C coming up, just so you're forewarned. Um, you don't need to worry about all the nuanced details. It's hopefully uh, fairly straightforward from the structure of this code that essentially what this is doing is checking to see if other, the thing we're comparing to, is a time. right? And if it is, it's going to do this comparison using this comp function. We don't need to worry about the details. Trust that it works. Uh, if other is not a time, then it's going to return nil. So now we see why that comparison was failing. Right? Because when we use time to do the comparison, that's passing through the time spaceship operator. Because of the way that active support time with zone is thwarting the type checking, it's going to pass directly through to this method. But this method doesn't know about active support's uh, type thwarting whatever games it's playing. It does a direct comparison based on Java classes. And active support time with zone is not a Ruby time. So we get back a nil. OK, so that's why it doesn't work in JRuby. Why does it work in MRI? Well, this is the definition of the time spaceship operator in MRI. 
we're in C code now. Um, again, don't need to worry too much about the details. Suffice to say, we've got this if-else block in the middle here. And the if branch is going to check and see if the thing we're comparing to, which in this case is time to, is that a time? Right? Is, is this a, a time value that we can compare to? If it is, we're going to do this comparison with wconf, whatever. Doesn't matter. If it's not a time, here's where it gets interesting. We're going to do this RB fun call, which is just the same as calling a method, but we've reversed the order of the arguments. We're using time two's spaceship operator and comparing against time one. And then we're going to take that result and we're going to negate it. And this uh, RB comp int thing is just bracketing the results so that it's our expected negative one, zero, or one. So this is why it works in MRI, because in MRI, when we do that comparison and time with zone fakes us out and attempts to do the time coercion, this first branch isn't going to work, right? Because time with zone is not a time val. But we'll take the else branch, which flips it around. And now we're doing the date time comparison with time, which does work because of the way it's defined. OK, so to recap, if other is a time object, do the comparison. If not, call the spaceship operator on the other, passing self as the argument. If that works, takes the negation. Otherwise, return nil. So this is why that piece of code works in MRI, not in JRuby. And therefore, it's fairly straightforward to fix JRuby. So this is the patch I submitted. And all it does is essentially the same thing that MRI is doing in Java instead of C. We're back in Java land, by the way. Um, so yeah, we're just simply checking and seeing if we can do the comparison. That if block at the top is unchanged, we'll do the comparison. If not, uh, invoke dynamic is JRuby's way of calling methods. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, opComp is the spaceship operator. And we're just simply flipping the order of the arguments. OK, so we're one Ruby down. One Ruby to go. All right. Uh, have any of you seen the uh, play or the movie Glengarry Glen Ross? Right? And there's this uh, famous thing uh, salespeople have an ABC, always be closing. Developers have ABCs too. Always be curious. Don't ever just let it go. And so I asked myself this is interesting. Time. If it can't do a forward comparison, we'll try the reverse and negate it. That works. I mean, that makes sense, right? But I wasn't expecting that to happen. I wonder where else this sort of reverse comparison happens in MRI. OK, so we know time. We've already seen it. Uh, string. String does a reverse comparison. And that's it. OK, I don't know why those two classes were the only ones chosen to be able to do this reverse comparison, but that's the way it is. But, oh, MRI. OK, this is strings spaceship operator now. OK, this is quite a bit messier than uh, times spaceship, so we're going to take it and we're going to break it down a little bit. OK, so. First of all, I've hidden 17 lines of the outer if block so that we can see what this is actually doing. If other is a string, we're going to do a string comparison Okay, uh, in the else block. I don't know. A code style is a, you know, a very subjective thing, but typically I would consider the common cases something you should put in the if block, not the else, but whatever. Um, OK, so what's in those 17 lines that we've hidden? All right, well, the first thing we do is we're going to check and see if other can be converted to a string. If you're not familiar with the to str method in Ruby, it's a method that's reserved. It's sometimes called internal coercion, right? So to s is external coercion. It allows you to convert something to a string. And the idea there is that anything can be converted into a string, right? I can take your object and I can tell you what kind of object it is and its object ID, right? And that's, that's a 2s. To stir should only be defined on objects that are string equivalents, right? So in other words, by calling this, we get something that's almost exactly the same in string form as what the original was, right? So we check and see if we can do this internal conversion. If not, we're going to return nil. We're going to check and see if other has a spaceship operator, right? If other 
doesn't have a spaceship operator, if it can be converted to a string but it doesn't have a spaceship operator, then we're going to return nil. If other does have a comparison operator and does have a toStir method, we're going to call it and return the negation of the result. But did you catch? There's two things that are weird about this. First of all, we check to see if there is a 2str method, but we never called it. And second, the top here is from time spaceship operator, and the bottom is what we have in string. In time, when we do the reverse comparison, we call this uh, rb comp int and negate that, which is going to bracket our values. In string, we're just negating the fixed num conversion from long uh, of whatever is returned. So this is where we get to have fun with poorly specified behavior in Ruby. Right? So you can define a class. This works in, um, I think, 1.9 still. You can define a class that defines a nonsense 2str method. Let's have it raise. Right? And you can define a spaceship operator that returns whatever value you want. And if you compare that object with a string, <laughs> First of all, 2str never gets called. And secondly, we're just going to negate whatever the heck the spaceship wanted to return. So yeah, that's um, kind of unexpected. So I pointed this out to uh, the core team. And I said, let's fix MRI. And so this is what we came up with. Um, the first part where the 2str method was being checked for existence but not actually called, we fix that so that we're actually going to call that method if it exists, right? Because why else would we be checking for it? And if we can convert something with a 2str internal coercion method, then we're going to do a, a straight string comparison. Initially, my, uh, my pleading that they also consider bracketing the values to negative 1, 0, and 1, it was deemed that that was too much code change, and it was kind of late in the 2.0 development process. And I said, OK, that's fine, because uh, to be perfectly honest, the comparable module really doesn't care if your values are just negative 1, 0, or 1. All it's checking is it 0 greater than 0 or less than 0. So OK, so we'll call it a half fix. OK. So is that it? Did you catch the problem that we've created for ourselves? What if we now do this? Because now we have two classes in Ruby that if they cannot do a direct comparison, will attempt to do a reverse comparison. So if you attempt to, create, to compare a time with a string, Time doesn't know how to compare with string directly. So it's going to do this reverse thing, where it asks the string to compare itself to time. But strings don't know how to compare themselves to time, so they're going to reverse it, and they're going to ask the time to compare itself to a string. I wonder if anybody noticed. Yeah, you can count on Eric Hodel to notice these kinds of things. And he actually filed the bug. But I'm actually really glad that he did. I, I, my first, I, I'll admit, my first reaction when I saw this bug filed was, I can't believe it. Like, I finally got a patch accepted to MRI, and it's got all kinds of bugs. But uh, I guess that's life. Um, my, my next reaction was, wait, this is kind of neat. Because now we get to have fun with mutual recursion, right? This is kind of a, a classic computer programming problem that uh, you know, we don't often face, but it's, it's not exactly the easiest thing in the world to resolve. So this is the solution. I think it was Nobu who ended up coming up with the solution. Um, I'll have to double check that. But this is the solution that ended up, uh, coming, uh, he ended up coming up with. Uh, this is, again, the spaceship operator for string. Uh, a similar thing works for time. Uh, and the key thing here, that don't worry about too much of the rest of the structure, it's this inner else block, right? where if we can't do the normal comparisons that we want to, we're going to call this RB invcomp. Right? So what we've done now is we've actually created a method for MRI that embodies the semantics of doing an inverse comparison when the forward comparison fails. And this is what that method looks like. We're going to do this RB exec recursive. We're going to pass it a method, uh, uh, 
function pointer. Sorry, we're in C again. Uh, a function pointer to a function, and we're going to pass it some arguments. And uh, this RB exec recursive is actually this really interesting function that exists in MRI. What it does is it runs the function that you pass it, and it also passes, it passes this function to arguments, but it also passes in a count of how many levels have we recursed. So if we look at what this incomp recursive method is doing, it's actually very simple. It's just simply checking to see if we've recursed more than once. And if we have, well then, you know, we compared time with string, that didn't work. We asked string to compare it with time, that didn't work. That's one level of recursion. Don't go any deeper than that. Throw back a nil. If not, we're going to actually do the inverse comparison where we substitute x for y and y for x. Okay. So what's the moral of this story? We've taken a look at a bug in JRuby, and we got it fixed. We took a look at a bug in MRI, and we got it fixed, and then we got the fix fixed. Hopefully, what this should teach us is that having multiple implementations is actually really important. Because originally, MRI was the only game in town. And therefore, by default, whatever MRI did was Ruby. But when we start implementing Ruby in other languages or on other platforms, then we get the chance to go back and look again. Are these behaviors actually the behaviors we want? Do these things actually make sense? And lately, if you've been following any of the conversation around things like uh, refinements, it allows us to actually build robust language structures that are not just tricks of the underlying implementation. I think you'd be surprised, actually, if you look at MRI, how much of what MRI does is just a trick of the fact that it's implemented in C. A lot of the stuff that it does doesn't work outside of a language like C. And what about fragmentation? Well, this is one thing where I think that Ruby, hopefully, so far, is mostly immune. And that's because unlike some of the other languages that have historically uh, suffered from fragmentation and eventually uh, sort of been shuffled off into insignificance, Ruby still communicates. We still have a community that comes together and talks. So when JRuby finds a bug in MRI, we're not afraid to say there's a bug in MRI. When MRI comes up with a new feature, the other Rubies are willing to consider implementing it. And if they have a problem, then they'll gladly go back and tell MRI that this is a problem, right? So ultimately, I think, even if you only ever use MRI, and I realize that for the foreseeable future, this will be the majority of Rubyists, even still, having these alternative implementations is a very, very good thing for Ruby. Okay, and that's it. Thanks. Questions? Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess uh, something very important is the existence of the Ruby spec about this, <laughs> and the effort of uh, Charlie Nutter and uh, Brian Shirai and to to make the difference between Ruby, the language, and different implementations? What do you think about this? Um, <laughs> it's funny that's the first question. Those are the slides I didn't include. In this particular case, let me tell you about Ruby spec. Uh, when I found this bug in JRuby, I didn't immediately jump to the C of MRI. I first checked the Ruby spec. And something really interesting, or I'm sorry, not the JRuby bug, the string bug in MRI, right? When I was going back to the string bug and I was thinking to myself, is this really how string is supposed to behave? I went to the Ruby spec. And Ruby spec had in its spec for string uh, this exact test where it defined to stir, but to stir doesn't get called, right? And it had a comment above the spec, this is dumb. Right? Or something along the lines of, you know, like, this is stupid. Why is this working this way? Right? Ruby spec is important, but it's only important if we allow it to be a conversation. And 
I think, I, I think that, that Ruby spec has the risk of becoming just a document, right? Like a static, you know, snapshot. This is how MRI works. Deal with it, right? And it shouldn't be, right? I, I really would have liked when that spec was written and that comment was written. That's when it really should have initially been brought up to the MRI core team. Hey, did you guys know that you're calling or that you're checking for a two-stir method on objects and not calling it? Um, but instead, it was just simply documented and shoveled away. So Ruby spec is important, but the problem with Ruby spec is that nobody's building applications with Ruby spec, right? Uh, people are building applications with JRuby. They're building applications with RubyMotion and uh, Rubinius and you know some of these other implementations. And it's really in the building of things, the solving of problems, that we truly appreciate uh, where behaviors say don't work exactly the way we think they should. So, but Ruby spec is still a valuable part of the conversation. So. Any other questions? Yeah, I actually had the exact same question. Um, so yeah, I guess like the Ruby spec. Um, but um, I was just curious, did you see how these uh, edge cases behave on Rubinius? You know, it's interesting. I haven't actually gone back. And, and actually, I am remiss to say, um, I, I've, since this work happened, I've actually been uh, sort of carried away with other work. Um, I believe the string behavior in JRuby is still buggy. I think uh, they, because they don't have that uh, inverse comparison uh, recursion check, and they, I think the string doesn't do the in inverse comparison. It's less noticeable uh, on string. And actually, I mean, so um, to answer your question about uh, Ruby spec, <laughs> um, uh, there's sort of this. Uh, uh, sort of tribal knowledge that uh, Ruby spec is great and all, but the real question is, can you run Rails, right? And, and this is part of why that's uh, the case, is because the only reason that that time comparison bug was ever found in JRuby is because of this really wacky situation that exists in active support time with Zone, right? Where it's trying to fake things out and do weird comparisons. And um, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess we have to go back and look at all the implementations and, and make sure. You know. If anybody else wants to get patches submitted, uh, mm -hmm. you might get to it before I do, so feel free. Any other questions? No? Thank you. <laughs>